Hey everyone, uh, we're here to talk today about our journey from Solidity Dev to ZK Dev. Uh, talk about how we went from uh, Solidity developers it got introduced to zero knowledge cryptography and went on to implementing BattleZip. So, uh, my name's Ian. And I am Jack. And yeah, like we said, we're going to walk you through our journey and uh, how we got to where we are today. Um, but first off, I want to start by uh, thanking the Ethereum Foundation. Um, just over a year ago today, BattleZips was just an idea. And to go from presenting at ETH Denver, uh, receiving a, gra a grant from the Ethereum Foundation up here, uh, presenting at DevCon today, you know, it's a pretty surreal experience. So, um, None of us expected this, so thank you. So, uh, before jumping into what uh, our journey in ZK, first let's start off with a question: What is Web three? Shout it out! Please, yeah, please raise your hand. What is Shout Web three? Uh, I think decentralized. decentralized. <laughs> All right, answers. Uh, I think to really get an appreciation for what the definition of Web3 is, though, uh, it'd be, be helpful to look at what some of the titans of the industry have said. So Satoshi, oh wait, that's not Satoshi, I guess. Okay, you know, we'll go with that. Satoshi, and I just want to preface real quick, uh, blockchain predated Web3 by about five years. Uh, so this is defined in Satoshi's terms of uh, what Bitcoin was. Um, but he basically said, Bitcoin is a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash, which would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial, uh, financial institution. Uh, next, someone we probably all recognize here as well, uh, <laughs> Vitalik Buterin. Uh, in the context of Ethereum, his definition of Web3 was, what Ethereum intends to provide is a blockchain with a built-in, fully-fledged Turing-complete programming language that could be used to create contracts that then can be used to encode arbitrary state transition functions. But none of this would be possible if it weren't for the work of Nick Zabo, who uh, coined the term smart contract and came up with the idea in 1994. And his, uh, his idea of what this eco uh, ecosystem represented was the obscurity of a large random number so vast that a lucky guess is unlikely if the, and if desired, the lifetime of the universe. And that's the foundation on which uh, cryptographic protocols are in, and in turn smart contracts are built. And then finally, appropriately ending at the uh, founder of, or the coiner of the term Web3, Gavin Wood, his definition was, in short, we engineer the system to mathematically enforce our prior assumptions since no government or organization can reasonably be, uh, be trusted. So that leaves us with our own definition. Web3 is sovereignty in cyberspace. And following from that, cryptography is the authority, uh, the enforcer of the laws in this new uh, in set space. So now that we have uh, a definition, a little bit of the etymology of Web3, uh, let's talk about the actual state of this industry um, and specifically some of the issues that are plaguing it. Um, personally, we see the biggest issue as being the um, almost zealous conviction in tokenization of all assets and uh, perhaps this might be a little america centric but um you know you could just take a look at the housing market as an example of an asset class that maybe you don't want to hyper financialize and what we essentially are seeing is that as time has gone on protocol is focused more and more on uh, financial prosperity rather than the actual core tenets of what web3 is supposed to be as, as we just went over um and beyond that, uh, I'm sure a lot of you here have heard a lot of talk about privacy and scalability over the past uh, few hours. Um, again, from uh, an individual perspective and uh, from an enterprise perspective, uh, it's unusable uh, a lot of the time. So, I mean, if you tried to uh, make a swap when Ether was at $4,800, you probably paid $50 for a swap. That's bad. That, that hurts. Um, and uh, while some of us have... Uh, gone ahead with uh, Web3 despite privacy concerns, there are a lot of ways that um, private information can be leaked. And then on the front of enterprises, they've just full blown <laughs> written it off for these reasons. Uh, a $50 transaction fee is a non-starter. And the fact that um, certain information is public on a public blockchain, again, is a non-starter. So we saw the rise of private blockchains, and those were also ruled out as, uh, while they are private and scalable to the outside, you are still sharing critical business information with the other validators who happen to be competitors in the industry. So. What we've seen is essentially, uh, at least until uh, recently, the solutions were just not there. 
So uh, really, we think that uh, we can summarize this issue uh, in a single way, uh, that Web3, uh, which is mostly become synonymous with DeFi, uh, uh, DeFi, decentralized finance, has lost the plot of Web3. Uh, cryptocurrency has become this mechanism for profit generation, whereas that's not really what Bitcoin was supposed to be. Bitcoin, while it has appreciated considerably from being worthless back in uh, 2000, 2009, um, it appreciated because of its financial agency and stability relative to fiat currencies. It was designed to be uh, not censorable or manipulatable. You can print more than 21 million. And the fact that it appreciated in this economic condition is a consequence. It, it wasn't explicitly engineered to go up. And then we have protocols like uh, Terra Luna, um, where uh, you know, there wasn't too much innovation on the side of the decentralization or peer-to-peer -peer networks or cryptography, but they did present uh, you know, a novel algorithmic stablecoin, which turned out to be a financial weapon of mass destruction. Um, a lot of capital was destroyed, both for retail investors and institutional investors, lost a lot of money. And not only is this bad for the industry just because there are resources that um, are, are suddenly uh, taken away, it actually causes a recession in uh, decentralization in this industry. And this is, I think, something even uh, Vitalik has brought up. Uh, as we uh, create these insane volatile uh, liquidity events, uh, governments notice and they decide that their mandate is to exert force or exert power over um, these industries. So as we create more of these um, opportunities for them to notice, uh, we lose decentralization. So uh, essentially what we want to say, uh, or we want to see to uh, have Web3 grow uh, to where I think we all see it being in the future, is for Web3 to break out of decentralized finance and become something more than just uh, a monetary tool. And we kind of see that with like decentralized science, decentralized uh, social media, um, some governance tools are uh, definitely more focused on information rather than the financial aspect. But what we really believe is that zero knowledge cryptography is gonna cause an explosion in these tools. So um, specifically, you might, if, if you're um, a little unfamiliar with zero knowledge, uh, you might think of tornado cash and uh, how zero knowledge can be used as a tool of anonymity or potentially even subversion of, of central authority or surveillance. However, it's actually important to note that um, at uh, pretty much its inception, uh, one of the thought experiments for um, like justifying the need for zero knowledge was denuclearization between bitter enemies, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, they needed to prove to each other that uh, they were actually denuclearizing, uh, but they didn't want to send uh, or they didn't want to allow inspectors from each other's countries into their nuclear bases. So to have uh, disjointed or adversarial parties that are able to coordinate and prove things to each other is incredibly valuable, both in the decentralized context uh, where you know, parties are just disinterested and perhaps in more centralized contexts like uh, the relationship that individuals often have with central authorities where incentives are very much misaligned. We can start to build solutions that kind of bridge that gap. So going into the specifics, um, again, we can, uh, on one end, we have Tornado Cash coin mixers, which are uh, ultimate tools of anonymity. And on the exact opposite end of the spectrum, with very similar code, uh, we have uh, tools of, of compliance, know your customer, anti-money laundering. Um, and uh, moving on, uh, there's also, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen, uh, like the temporary anonymous zone, all the semaphore stuff. Um, there's uh, the ability to create um, a, anonymous social media uh, programs that, again, allow um, coordination without uh, any sort of central authority. And uh, on a completely unrelated vertical, we can construct IFF signals, which many of you probably don't know what those are, but essentially um, identification friend or foe signals go on combat aircraft and uh, when they're flying through an airspace, uh, you can basically, with a zero knowledge IFF, you would prove that you're allowed to be flying in that airspace without actually revealing the details of that mission. Um, again, we can um, start to fortify uh, trustless computing, even bulletproof hosting. Um, and again, on, on the other side of things, um, we can be uh, fortifying uh, centralized processes. Uh, specifically, let's take uh, the IRS. Uh, there's a little bit of entropy that goes into the audit lottery. So we wanna make sure that that, is, uh, that entropy is sampled correctly. As well, all of the parameters that are used to choose how someone is audited, we wanna make sure that those are all correctly chosen uh, and proved. And then finally, um, 
something that uh, is not so new. Uh, Chainlink has been working on proof of reserves for a while, but facilitates the uh, unbanking of populations. Um, and again, on the other hand, we can have uh, centralized supply chains. So uh, take the uh, distribution, let's say, of alcohol. When you go to a bar, you need to prove that you are of age. And the bartender needs to uh, prove that they are only de um, distributing uh, alcohol to people who are of age. And uh, this takes the form of uh, literal cops sending in uh, minors to actually test these places, and that is um, a reactive solution that uses resources, um, whereas if we were able to have a, a system where you can't even get in the door if you can't prove you're 21, um, we create uh, a lot more, we free up resources for um, obviously the people who are checking, uh, the cops, and then as well it, it makes the lives of uh, both, um, well, really the distributor, a lot easier given the compliance is, is managed in a programmatic way, and a prov uh, provably correct way. So just to summarize it, uh, we have uh, Semaphore again, um, which is uh, something that could be used for anonymous coordination or uh, KYC AML. So what you should really be thinking is that zero knowledge is an incredibly versatile tool and how it is actually molded into whatever product, uh, that's up to you. So specifically, uh, if you are uh, kind of intrigued by Semaphore and you think that you have uh, some way to contribute, there's actually a grant round going on right now. Um, I, it said uh, 14th on an earlier thing, but I'm pretty sure that this link says uh, the 28th, so I would uh, highly encourage you, again, if uh, this is remotely uh, interesting, uh, to look into that grant, because uh, there's a huge community of like-minded people. So, Awesome, yeah, with the background of uh, some of the applications of zero knowledge, let's jump into uh, the actual history and how this came into being. So. Uh, no doubt, uh, zero knowledge has very much been much uh, somewhat of a zeitgeist this past year. Everyone's talking about it, how it could be used for privacy purposes, scalability. But uh, what not many people might know is that actually uh, you can trace its genesis back to 1985, uh, two years after the founding of TCP/IP, and six years prior to the first website on the World Wide Web. Uh, it was first published in an obscure paper by Goldwasser, Macaulay, and Rakoff, and uh, Really, with this paper, it first introduced the whole entire concept of zero-knowledge cryptography, but it'd be about three decades until we actually saw uh, some continual or some additional work on this. Uh, in 2013, we saw the first ZK snark uh, implemented through something called Pinocchio. Um, we saw the first example of a ZK VM through uh, TinyRAM. Uh, these weren't blockchain-specific uh, per se, but three more years, we would begin to realize the uh, you know, the opportunity that zero-knowledge cryptography really could provide in terms of scaling uh, and providing privacy to Ethereum. And this happened through uh, the proving mechanism called Groth16, which was really the first practical ZK snark, you know, something that could uh, handle almost any arbitrary comp uh, computational uh, problem and uh, encrypt it. Um, two years later, we would see uh, a golden year in zero knowledge cryptography. Uh, Barry Whitehat implemented the first roll up as far as we were able to, uh, to uh, ascertain. Uh, CIRCOM, a language made specifically for writing ZK circuits, uh, were released by an organization called IDEN3. Uh, the foundation of the ZK Stark, which is a uh, different um, type of zero knowledge proof uh, apart from SNARKs, that stands for zero, no or sorry, uh, scalable transparent argument of knowledge. And uh, what it really provides. Um, that snarks don't is it's quantum resistant and it also removes the need for a trusted setup, which up until this point has been a uh, major complaint of implementing zero knowledge proofs. Uh, fast forward to 2019 and Aztec released a new proving scheme for snarks called Plunk. Uh, this didn't totally get rid of the, proof, uh, the trusted setup, but what it did allow is a universal trusted setup. So instead of needing to provide, uh, perform a lengthy trusted setup for every single snark you implement, uh, you only have to do one that can then be applied to many. Um, a year after that, uh, StarkNet released their own ZKVM called StarkX with its native language called Cairo. Uh, importantly to us, uh, Zcash started work on the Halo 2 proving scheme, which uh, is foundational for Battleships V2, what we want to accomplish there, and uh, we'll talk about that a bit later uh, in our presentation. A year after that, Mina came along with the idea of SNAPS, zero knowledge applications, or zero knowledge dApps, as well as CIRCOM released, uh, or IDEN3 released CIRCOM 2.0, uh, which really 
with that, that's what made it possible to uh, release Battleships V1 and present at ETH Denver uh, back at, earlier in 2022. Then fast forward to uh, modern day, a year later, 2022, uh, Plonky 2, the successor to Plonk, uh, allows proving speeds that are 100, time fa 100 times faster. Uh, ZK EVMs are beginning to enter the mix uh, in the experimental stage uh, that include Polygon Hermes, Scroll, which actually implements Halo 2, and then uh, ZK Sync as well. And then finally, uh, an interesting uh, application that exists now is ZPrize, which is a uh, zero knowledge analog of XPrize. What it basically aims to do is uh, provide a list of bounties so that um, those interested in improving the uh, efficiency, which with um, zero knowledge algorithms compute, uh, can go and claim these prizes. Um, but yeah, no, now that we've gone through the lengthy history, let's talk about how you can actually apply ZK to uh, the EVM. And to do this, you really have two options. Uh, you have the option of applying a domain-specific language or utilizing a ZK virtual machine. Um, and both, both uh, methods have their own pros and cons, their own trade-offs. And ultimately, what it comes down to is, you know, what are you trying to achieve with your application? What's the scope of it? Um, but we'll, we'll uh, go through the pros and cons right here. Yeah, this pointer's tricky. Um, so when it comes to a uh, DSL, scaling requires expertise. Um, but with a ZK uh, EVM, the entire purpose of this uh, other network is really to allow scalability of your applications. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> with DSLs, computation is verified directly on layer one. Uh, but with ZK VMs, technically they are a layer two, so all computations take place on uh, SIP layer two. Uh, and then consensus for DSLs comes from the root Ethereum network of your choice. And then again, uh, touching on the point just before, uh, a layer two or a ZKVM being a layer two, you know, you're relying on an entirely separate set of security and uh, validators that you trust will uh, put your, um, eventually reach consensus on layer one, but ultimately it's up to this external network. And then uh, when it comes to DSLs, uh, the software development kits that exist right now do their best to abstract away complexity, but really what ends up happening is uh, you kind of have to put on another thinking cap. Um, you know, for those of us who are used to uh, developing in um, standard languages, you really, when writing zero knowledge proofs, can't get away without learning some of the cryptographic principles, uh, underlying elliptic curves, uh, finite fields, constructing arithmetic circuits. So. There's definitely a lot of overhead and a lot of investment you have to put in before you can actually get to writing your own program. Um, whereas in a VM, uh, it's specifically abstracting a lot of the ZK uh, overhead away. So you can get in with knowledge as a developer and get ahead and running your apps like that. Um, and then finally, talking about portability uh, between DSLs and VMs. Uh, what a DSL basically allows you to do is it's a way of constructing your uh, files for proving and verifying uh, zero-knowledge proofs. And then it's up to you where you want to deploy them to, uh, be it uh, a Solidity smart contract on uh, the root Ethereum chain. It's really up to you where you deploy to. But when it comes to ZK VMs, you face vendor lock-in risk. You know, you might have a specific idea of what chain you want your application to end up on, but down the road, uh, if you're, um, you know, if the scope of your project changes, you can end up being locked in and, um, you know, uh, uh, lose some flexibility that way. But the route we ended up going on is uh, the DSL route. And for that, we chose CIRCOM. Uh, CIRCOM was an obvious choice because it intuitively uh, provides a language that closely mirrors the cryptography you have to learn. Um, so after going through that headache, learning the ins and outs of the underlying cryptography, you can pretty much write out everything you've been working on the past weeks or months, however long it takes you. Uh, but Anyways, uh, as much as we love CIRCOM, we found it difficult to uh, actually go from beginner ZK developer to releasing battle zips. We actually have crafted our own Git book called uh, Awesome CIRCOM. And uh, you can reach us there by scanning the QR code or go to battlezips.com slash resources. But I uh, just want to preface that it's not quite done yet, but come this Friday, it should be complete. Um, but yeah, check it out for sure. Yeah, so um, again, we uh, are working to get that just about finished, but um, we have uh, basically uh, 
taking the topics that we think are uh, important from uh, you know someone who's absolute newbie uh, to basically be introduced to borderline spoon-fed. Um, and there are some that are really well documented, um, be it uh, the proving systems, Groth 16 and Planck, and um, the powers of tau ceremony that is trusted setup for Groth 16. We don't really need to do a lot uh, for that. We are really just aggregating existing documentation and putting it in uh, an easy to access uh, format. On the other hand, we have uh, multiplexing in CIRCOM. This is a, a little hidden tidbit that took us a while to figure out. If you read the CIRCOM documentation, you will be misled into thinking that you can use if statements. You cannot use if statements the way you think. Uh, if you try to use an if statement to compute a condition, um, to select a conditional statement in CIRCOM, you will get an error called non-quadratic constraints not allowed. Very dreaded. Uh, and to circumvent it, essentially you need to do something called signal multiplexing, which is where in zero knowledge you compute both cases, or let's say you have n different branches of logic, you compute all n branches. And only once you've computed every single branch in zero knowledge, then can you select which branch you want. And this is, uh, this is uh, an analogy from electrical signal processing. I believe this is how uh, TV channels and cable even works. But um, the point is, if you aren't familiar with this, I know I wasn't when I was looking through various code bases and looking at multiplexing, and while you see an if statement in the documentation, it can be very confusing. But um, So that's an example of something we go more in depth on. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to speed through a little bit of this. Um, but uh, we have some stuff that's, again, more documented, uh, which is the arithmetic-friendly implementations of uh, different hashing algorithms, which then uh, underlie the signing algorithms. So SHA-3 and um, uh, ECDSA uh, out the window. Uh, we're now using Poseidon or MIMC at the very least, and uh, EDDSA, which are far more efficient. Um, we have Merkle trees, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, but they are one of the most powerful tools, uh, both for privacy and scalability. We can take a massive, massive data set and compress it into a tiny hash. And not only is this clearly a, a method for scaling, but we're also taking that data set and obscuring the data within it while still being able to operate on it. So this gives us both privacy and scalability. So you will definitely be working with Merkle trees. Um, and then there is first and third party dev tooling. Um, the first party dev tooling you literally just have to use. Um, CIRCOM uh, relies on SnarkJS to uh, actually put proofs in the EVM. Um, and then there's also CIRCOM Tester, which unless you want to spend two hours running tests every single time, uh, you're going to want to use something that simulates the logic rather than actually running the entire overhead. And then there's also third party tooling, which is maybe not as required, but still is very important for having a good time developing. So there is the Shield CLI, which was just released, uh, I believe, two weeks ago. Uh, they released their first non-beta version. Um, and you can think of Shield as hard hat or maybe truffle for CIRCOM. Uh, essentially, it um, takes, you'll see in the BattleZips code base, there are a couple of bash files that handle the generation of circuits. And this is something that uh, requires an understanding of what you're doing. Whereas the Shield CLI will just do this for you. So whether you're already experienced with the CIRCOM, SnarkJS, and Solidity stack, or you uh, are brand new especially, it's going to be uh, very helpful for kickstarting uh, a new repository. And then there's also the Circumspect uh, static analyzer. Um, and this is another thing in CIRCOM, uh, the debugging and error messages leave a little bit to be desired. So having uh, a tool like uh, uh, Circumspect to uh, analyze your code, point out, areas where perhaps you're uh, misconstraining, misconstraining something or you're just not correctly writing code is, is very valuable. So again, uh, circumspect and shield CLI, very important. And then finally, um, implementations. Uh, we've done a couple of videos and we've got stuff on there, so I'm not really going to go into it, but um, the actual specifics of using CIRCOM. So now that we've kind of gone through uh, all of uh, what that is, uh, again, I think there's like one more minute, so I'll be quick. but. Um, we built uh, our, our original version of BattleZips as a purely a privacy preservation tool. And uh, this is mostly what we've been speaking to you about today, uh, CIRCOM. So this essentially allowed us to prove uh, an adversarial uh, interaction between two parties where they could still trust each other uh, without revealing all this information. So it was a great proof of concept for us to demonstrate um, private information on a public blockchain. But it fell short in a, a lot of ways. Uh, the scalability is pretty trash, to be honest. And um, uh, the intermediate state, so you're still hiding the ship positions, but um, 
hits and misses, uh, all the different turns in a game, all that's public. So moving on, what we're now working on with the assistance of the Ethereum Foundation uh, through the grant is Battles of Speed 2. And this is uh, a little more uh, exciting and novel, we think. Um, essentially, uh, we want to demonstrate using battleships um, the generation of state in a state channel off-chain, and then we summarize the entire state channel um, in a single transaction using zero knowledge. Um, and what this allows us to do is produce um, these interesting proofs. So you, you get this uh, almost immutable or um, indivisible object, uh, a battleship game, a valid battleship game occurred between Alice and Bob, where Alice won and Bob lost. We'll talk about that in a second, but um, essentially this benefits both privacy in that you have uh, the intermediate state shielded and scalability in that um, you're batching all these transactions. And um, we intend to demonstrate how that can be used to uh, derive qualitative insights without revealing uh, a ton of like personal information uh, using ELO scores. So I think we'll just skip to the next slide, but because it's kind of the same thing. Um, Again, uh, battle zips and, and zips as a, a kind of data structure um, is uh, basically state channel summary um, where we're rolling up all of the state that we generate in like a ephemeral layer two. Um, we collapse it back onto layer one uh, as soon as the state generation is done. And um, we already talked about the battleship, battleship proof, but uh, there are a couple of more real world examples that um, are exciting to us. Uh, take uh, proof of a valid delivery. Um, you know, there's a bunch of different parts that go into it. Perhaps there's IoT, um, temperature controls, uh, or perhaps uh, there's an inertial sensor on something that's fragile and can't be moving in transit. Uh, chain of custody. Whatever you decide is necessary for your um, supply chain, uh, you can then package that into a single proof of delivery. And what that, uh, the consequence of that is that the participants in this, uh, say the delivery drivers who have no interest in being doxxed on chain, uh, don't have to be doxxed on chain. You can start to involve them in these economies without them being exposed to all these negative externalities that Web3 currently exposes us to. And um, again, just another example, which is uh, a little less novel. Obviously, there's um, you know snapshot, which is somewhat centralized, but um, essentially we can uh, you know take this entire um, uh, voting process off chain. Um, I assume it probably looks a lot like Macy too, actually, in in um, uh, premise, but. Uh, instead of uh, it occurring, all of the state accumulating on chain, um, where uh, in, in Moloch style, uh, it's, it's all even public, uh, we are accumulating uh, the vote off chain and then rolling up uh, a proof that a, a vote occurred on this proposal where 65% of stakeholders approved it or 65% of governors or, or whatever. So uh, it creates these kind of indivisible proofs that uh, can be used for various things. So. Yeah, um, so if you guys have uh, any, sure, yeah, um, really quick, any desire to uh, be working on this and you're struggling to get started, um, we have, I think, in uh, the Battlezips resources, we have a link to our Discord, um, you can go in there and drop literally any question, we'll do our best to answer it. With the QR? Yeah, QR no. oh. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, and then are there any questions? We maybe have time for like one or two. Okay. If not, another huge round of applause for Jack and Ian. Thank you.